my name is Jayla Medjadovic and I am an author of algorithms and data structures uh, for massive data sets. So today I want to talk about hashing. Either you know about it explicitly or you're using it but you don't know that you're using it. So the question is why did I decide to talk about hashing today? It's actually chapter two of our book and there's two reasons uh, for that. Uh, one reason is that uh, hashing is a backbone for all the SYSIN data structures in part one that we talk about. So on one hand, hash it's, it's kind of good to know hashing starting this book because it's a good review for the chapters to come. However, hash tables have also over time been adapted to serve in these massive distributed uh, systems. And today we're going to look at one algorithm uh, that is for distributed hashing, which is called consistent hashing. Hashing is everywhere and uh, pretty much it's easier to kind of find an application. It's much easier to find an application that uses hashing than the one that doesn't. Uh, if you just think of an example of how many times you use hashing while you send an email. Uh, first of all, when you log in, the password is hashed at the server and it's checked against the database to verify a match, right? So if, if there's a match, then you can log in. Um, as you write an email, spell checker will hash words to check uh, whether something is correctly spelled. Um, when you send an email, uh, each email is kind of split into little packets and each packet on it carries a hash, uh, hash of an IP uh, destination, IP address. So if it's a non-existing hash, then the packet bounces. And then on the arriving side, when somebody receives your email, a spam filter might use hashing to check whether your email contains one of those uh, spam-like words to kind of classify it as spam. Uh, and pretty much with pretty much anything, I could give you an, you know, an example of hashing being used in, in, in pretty much every application at least two or three times. Um, one of the applications kind of more modern applications when it comes to big data and dealing with large data sets is uh, deduplication. Um, deduplication is uh, something basically it's the process of removing duplicates and uh, it's especially important in these storage backup systems such as I don't know, Dropbox or data domain and applications like that. So basically what happens there is if you're working for a company like that, then you might have a very big clients like enterprise clients and you might have a contract with them where you are uh, taking backups of their data. So if between two consecutive snapshots of data, let's say between every 24 hours, uh, you might notice that most of the content, like 99% or more of the content, is actually identical, right? People modify some files, uh, but between, you know, in a short time span, not much changes. And basically what they do is they're saying, well, we're not going to store the whole, uh, all of the data every new time again. Uh, first of all, that takes a lot of bandwidth, and second of all, that takes a lot of space, and it's just not a smart thing to do. So what they do is when they're getting new files is uh, they use hashing to quickly identify what they already have. So for example, uh, one such system is called Chunkstash, um, and so when a new file arrives, it's split into these little chunks and you might decide how big of a chunk you want to have. The smaller the chunk, the finer the granularity of your the duplication. And every chunk is hashed, right? So every chunk has a little hash associated with it. And for each of those hashes, you go to hash table and check whether you already have it. And if you don't have it, um, then the new chunk and the chunk ID are added both to the storage and to the 
hash table. Um, however, if you already have a chunk ID, then you just say, okay, this is a duplicate. We're not going to store this. So this is a um, kind of a very common thing that's, um, that's done nowadays in systems like that. And this process has to be really fast. You need to be really quick at figuring out uh, whether you need a new chunk or not. The duplication is there, uh, is, is kind of everywhere as well, um, and not just in the storage backup systems. Um, and actually something that was shown to be uh, at some point a uh, vulnerability is uh, it, it happened to users at some point, uh, from what I understand, is that they tried to upload like a huge file that would normally need a lot of time to upload and they would notice that they would immediately get the message that it's uploaded. Uh, so that's kind of a security vulnerability that I think was fixed uh, at some point uh, because it would let you know that somebody else has the same file. And if you have these little chunks, um, then that's sensitive to small edits of the file as well. So um, the duplication is really, um, is there's a lot of work on optimizing uh, the duplication process at many places. Um, and actually in this duplication, a, a string matching algorithm, a, a, a string hashing algorithm is uh, used, which is carp Rabin fingerprinting. And this is one of the fastest uh, string matching algorithms. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that it uses hashing, right? So uh, instead of comparing substrings, actual substrings, it compares hashes of subst substrings. Um, and, but I'm not going to go into more detail about that. You might already be familiar with uh, Carp Rabin. It's kind of a randomized, really fast string matching algorithm. So you might be thinking why we love hash tables so much, right? Um, well, first of all, uh, in short, it seems like a kind of a perfect dictionary. And why do I say perfect? Well, when you look at these other data structures like arrays and linked lists and binary search trees, hash tables are the only one that run in constant time when it comes to lookup, insert, and delete. Um, and so that's where the perfect comes from. Uh, however, where does the illusion come from? Well, it's only expected. Right, so it doesn't offer the kind of guarantee that a binary search tree offers that, you know, operations will not run longer than logarithmic time. So in hash tables, the worst case is linear time, which is pretty terrible. And the reason for that is because uh, many items might map to the same hash, hash bucket, which kind of turns your search into a linear kind of search. However, uh, this worst case linear time is not as bad as, as you would say that, let's say, unsorted arrays have a linear time search, right? That's also true. But that's not the same worst case linear time because in the case of arrays, uh, that worst case will happen very consistently, actually. You, every time you look for something that's not in the array, you will get linear time. However, with hash tables, if you have a pretty good hash function, it will happen almost never. So it doesn't offer guarantees that are constant time. Some versions of hash tables do, but interestingly, those are almost never implemented in real life because they complicate the common case. And we'll see more about the importance of common case in hash tables. So there's a kind of a ton of literature on hash functions. And uh, there's a lot of complicated math uh, also in relation to hash function. But the main thing to know about it is that uh, what hash function does, basically like a word is the same uh, source as hash brown. So it kind of minces and chops data into little pieces until the point when whatever the original data was is unrecognizable. And there's a lot of research on cryptographic hash functions, right? So how do you send something? How do you hash something so that nobody can figure out what is it that you hashed? Um, 
However, for the purposes of what we're talking about and what we're, uh, massive data structures, uh, we want much less from hash functions. Uh, we want simple and fast and easy to evaluate hash functions. And we want the hash functions that distribute data well in common cases. One of the examples of a set of hash functions that gained a lot of popularity is Murmur Hash, uh, in, originally invented by Austin Appleby. And I just want to show a little example here um, of Murmur Hash, one of the wrappers of MMH3. And here you have a function a dot, uh, uh, sorry, a method hash and hash 64 and hash 128, depending on how long hash you want to have. And you can set the seed, whether you want a signed or unsigned integer, or even what kind of architecture you have. Um, and the name of murmur hash came from um, multiply plus rotate, which are the main things that, uh, main ways to uh, chop and mince data in this function. Um, so that's kind of, uh, murmur hash has been used a lot in these uh, kind of succinct data structures. Uh, but whichever way you look at it, uh, hash functions are bound to introduce collisions. Uh, and that's because you're mapping a huge universe of potential items to um, a much smaller set of hash table buckets, right? So just by you know, a simple logic or pigeonhole principle, if you want to be mathematical about it, uh, you will always have some items going to the same bucket. So that's kind of a bad situation. Um, and to do that and to solve that problem, we have different collision resolution techniques. And I'm kind of assuming uh, people mostly know about these, so I'm not going to explain them too much. I'm just showing two basic ones, chaining and linear probing, where chaining associates a linear uh, linked list with each bucket. So all the items that hash to a particular bucket are stored in one list. For example, here in position three, you have B, D, and A. And once something again hashes to three, like C does here, uh, it's inserted at the front of the chain. Now, linear probing, on the other hand, stores uh, is a version of something called open addressing, and it stores item inside the slots. And if the position where you hashed is taken, then you search downward for the first available position to store an item. There are a lot more details to this, but for now, uh, let's say this is enough. And uh, there's people have researched about uh, what's faster, what works better, right? And uh, you have theorems saying that with high probability, these chains in the chaining table are going to be lengths in the worst case, no longer than log n over log log n. So some kind of a little bit less than logarithmic length. Whereas uh, the runs, the consecutive runs in linear probing are going to be of length logarithmic, so a little bit longer. Uh, why do we care about this? Well, clearly this length is what defines how long your search is going to be and how long your delete is going to be and so on and so forth. Um, and it kind of makes sense that the linear probing here has these longer runs because different items from different buckets can participate in the same run, whereas in chaining only the items from one bucket belong to a one linked list. Um, so there's a lot of debate of, you know, what's better and some methods like I think C++ a uh, hash table, unordered map uses chaining. I think even hash map in Java um, uses chaining, but there's a lot of criticism there as well, because chaining uses extra pointers, which is a lot of extra space. However, what's really a kind of an important detail that distinguishes linear probing is that all the items in linear probing are sequentially ordered in memory. So when you're fetching something, you're anyway fetching a whole cache line. So whether your run is, you know, log n or log n over log log n or one or a hundred, it matters a little less because you're doing one memory access. 
Whereas in chaining, you might be doing many memory accesses because of the way linked lists are laid out in memory. So a lot of the production hash tables actually use linear probing. So for example, if we look at how Python implements hash tables, Python uses uh, for their data structure dict, uh, which is one of the most widely used Python data structures, uh, it uses a hash table. And uh, if you are unfamiliar with dict, I'll just briefly show um, an example. Uh, here I have a dictionary in Python, which is basically a key value, a set of key value pairs. You can't have duplicate keys, but you can have duplicate values. Uh, and you have to use keys that are hashable, which means it cannot be a mutable type. It cannot be a list. It can be an integer, a double, a tuple, a string, something like that. So here if I run this um, Python dict example, you get that what the items are, what the keys are. Notice that in Python hash of 5 is 5. So it's not a very mysterious hash function that's used. Um, and so on and so forth. 